certain number of issues customarily gets represented for public consumption, as if balancing along a sort of shadow line where religion oversteps into politics and vice versa. Those are questions the political parties usually put forward in lists with yes or no boxes to be ticked off. Either the political program is pro-life or pro-so-called reproductive rights, pro-traditional family or pro-homosexual so-called marriages, pro-duty of maintaining and nourishing life or pro-right to quote-unquote die with dignity, etc. In the following we'll attempt to show that these issues represent less than a tip of the iceberg. In fact, they are a crooked image of the originally quite comprehensible principles, or quite uncompromising negation thereof, similar to a stick in the water which, albeit appearing crooked or distorted to our eyes, is in reality quite straight, from the top to bottom. Therefore, our purpose here is to go below the tip towards the base of the proverbial iceberg, not in order to show that the contrary binary is actually simplifications, but quite the opposite. The purpose here is to show just how deep this very simplicity goes. Of the three questions we have proposed as examples, we'll focus on the not-so-apparent origin of the issue of the right to die, so-called, or institutionalization of euthanasia the subject we already wrote about to some length. When we say not so apparent origin, this implies that the focus is not on euthanasia debate, but on the grounds or lack thereof from whence the idea comes in the first place. One peculiarity underlying the debate on euthanasia is that those who argue against it seem to have it much easier than those who argue against the practice of abortion or instituting of the homosexual marriages. There's something particularly appalling about the idea of terminating human life as it unfolds before our eyes, striking the conscience with certain immediacy not present in other issues of the congenial kind. The advocacy of both abortion and so-called marital homosexual union are revels from the radical shift in the understanding of life also, but an, the inversion at work there is not as apparent. One can be fooled into thinking that the shift better serves life than death, be it in the sense of liberating woman to a life more worthy of living, or letting love transcend inborn sexual duality of the human being. While both assumption are, assumptions are false, they are not divorced from the truth to an extent that it would render them immediately unacceptable to most people. However, the idea that life, so-called not worth living, should be legally terminated with the assistance, or even in some cases by the decision, of legal and medical professionals seems to intensify the matter to a radical extreme. It is our contention that this happens because the issue brings the matter of life and death in the clear light. Where decision to accept or reject life is not the fruit of the more or less complicated series of inferences, customarily requiring quite a bit of soul-searching, pushing the inquisitive person against the grain of contemporary society, but is based in the last instance on the purely conscious opting for death instead of life. Because death has been accepted either as good or no less evil than the life itself. As such, we would also argue the clarity of the matter tears asunder the veil dividing the so-called secular from so-called religious arguments against this practice. While it is customary for some opponents of euthanasia to claim how you don't need to be religious to argue against it, 
either out of conviction or as a strategic move to make their standpoint more publicly acceptable, the fact of the matter is that this is the point where the plunge into the depth of what is sometimes called culture of death becomes inevitable, and all illusions one might have about it are left behind, like so much flotsam on the surface. We'll posit that the stand one takes for or against euthanasia once its grounds are clearly understood, is by necessity a stand one takes for or against God. The crux of the matter is that we'll attempt to show that the attitude doesn't have to be conscious in order to be fully deliberate. It represents the point where atheism ceases to be simply an opinion and becomes also a deliberate choice of the active opposition and unmovable intellectual stance, first towards the creation and then towards the creator himself. To argue the point, now we have to turn to what everyday life tells us about life itself. More or less, everybody knows that lives of elderly, infirm and sick are to be maintained, nourished and made easier without necessarily grounding the practice in the rational system, explaining the role of death in human life. If one doesn't care about one's own parents, we can be sure that one will at least be ready and able, as is fashionable today, to denounce others for not doing so for their own people. Clearly then, as the practice is still preserved, even in the moralizing chatter, its roots have to run deep. Yet when someone asks us why we do it, i.e. why are we compelled to nourish life to the last moment, we can't really offer a systematic answer. Sometimes one is perplexed over such inability to give reasonable grounds for one's deepest convictions. Moreover, convictions that were already present long time ago, so that men of today are rather relying on them as a legacy than reinventing them. However, there is something even more perplexing, yet rarely addressed, because it becomes obvious only when the opposite question has been asked. Namely, why demand answer in the first place? And, crucially, why make the practice incumbent upon the ability to provide the systematic rationale for it? Perhaps it is not self-evident to everyone, but such opinion implies that the question of whether life is good in itself was never before posed, because systematic answers are not something we can find before the late 17th century circa 2,000 years after Plato and Aristotle indeed have posed and answered some important questions, yet, for some reason, never provided us with a system of answers. Therefore, why would everybody understand that he couldn't learn a foreign language in an instant while scarcely anyone would allow for the possibility that he cannot create the system, providing the answer to a final question such as this in the blink of an eye? Well, the answer to this dilemma is quite simple. We expect a simple answer because the question itself is a simple one. Natural understanding of simplicity, once it gets baptized in the acid bath of modernity, morphs into a false conviction that the most simple is also the most obvious, and that this obviousness must at some point equal consciousness. Hence, both those who approach life as good in itself and those who reject life as good in itself see their respective acts as simple, because simplicity itself acquired a new meaning, without the old one being completely obliterated but rather pushed in the pre-discursive domain of emotions, instincts and intuitions. The difference between them is obviously also a simple one. It stems from the different understanding of what is intuited as self-evident origin of truth, 
upon which every truth participates. Of course, one side would, if properly informed, reject our use of the platonic flavored methexis, that is to say participation or mediation, as a proper way to qualify something as true. But that hardly matters, because the assumption upon which we work here is that two sides are not equal, and that this discussion between them correspondingly can never be such. This means that we consider one of the two positions to be an inversion of the only one existing principle upon which something can be called true, and not an equally valid po opinion. In this sense, the refutation of such opinion is not a critical discussion in which one could find some middle ground with those who reject this principle, but an act of resolving their position into nothing, because their denial of the existence of the assumption of common ground is in itself an act of basing the argument on nothingness, understood in a quite positive sense. To avoid any ambiguity, the inability to perceive life as good in itself, if this inability comes from the simple insight into the reality of life itself, is nothing but negation, as its opposite would be an affirmation and whole lot of something originating thereof, because that is not an is, but a no. Equila equivalizing death and life is hence based on the inference that non-being is. In order to clarify this, we have to give an outline of what we consider to be ground, the ground for the claim that life is in itself is good. This ground brings us to what was traditionally understood inside the scope of the ancient Greek expression energeia. This may seem restrictive, even audacious to some, but we have to keep in mind that traditional words, notions and propositions such as this one are not really an equal commodity on the so-called marketplace of ideas, competing with supposedly quote-unquote new intellectual merchandise. In fact, modern and postmodern ontological quote-unquote competitors are the result of the sometimes quite violent transformation of what already existed, both conceptually and verbally. The only question is whether the reformed or the original form is closer to reality. So what is energeia? As it happens, precisely life itself is one form of it that could serve as an exemplary instance upon which we can understand the various meanings and modes of reality encompassed by the word. In this we assume that in order to understand something we have to begin with the most fulfilled and consequently the clearest mode in which we encounter it, and then proceed towards less imperfect ones. In the book 9, that is Theta of Aristotle, that's because there are two uh, alphas, uh, because in uh, Greek alphabet originally it would be 8th book of Aristotle's metaphysics, we have a clear example of such procedure. Quote, From actions, that is praxeon, which are limited, not a single one is an end, that is telos, end or purpose, but they are rather towards the end or purpose, as in thinning, the end or purpose is thinness, or being thin. And bodily parts, in the midst of thinning, are in such movement, kinesis, that thinning doesn't belong to a final why of the movement, while, that is Aristotle means, while it is occurring, it's not intrinsic to movement. So their movement is not an action, or at least not a perfect one, for it is not an end. But movement in which the end is, intrinsically, that is, present, is an act. As for example, seeing is simultaneous with having been seeing, comprehending and have been comprehending, thinking and have been thinking. But it is not simultaneous to learn and to be learned, or to heal and to be healed. However, 
it is simultaneous to live good or blessed and to have been living good, to live good life and to have been living a good life. Eidaimone kai eudaimonekem. This is present and, and perfect of eudaimono, uh, eudaimonei. It's very really hard to translate, to translate this from Greek, but let's call it good life. If not, the action would have to end at some point, as in the case of thinning and being thinned. But it doesn't, and one lives and simultaneously has been living. Therefore, one form of those should be called movements, whereas the others are acts, energeias. So act is energeia. For every movement is imperfect, that is, unfulfilled, thinning, learning, walking, building. Those are movements and hence unfulfilled. For it is not true that something walks and simultaneously has walked, builds and has built, coming into being and has been in being, or is moving and has been moving. But the thing moved is different from the mover. However, it is same to be seeing and to have been seeing, and thinking and has been thinking. Therefore, one is got movement, the, and the other is act. End quote. Aristotle, as one might notice, is not yet providing us with discursive arguments here. If he were to do that, he would first give definitions of movement and act, and then proceed to differentiate them in the body of affirmative and or negative statements in Greek kataphasis and apophasis. Instead, what he does is, quite in line with his general approach, something more fundamental. He explicates the actual content from which the essence, as its comprehensible mode of being, that is logos or eidos, emerges, before going forth and giving its definition. Something one might even call metaphysical empirism. This intellectual act could be with some reservations, called intuition, uh, but in contrast to the modern understanding of knowledge, there are no subjective connotations to it. Simply put, things reveal their origins to an extent that they are, or, more precisely, to an extent that they are in acting, and ergeia, I'm splitting the uh, originally composite word, ergon means deed, or act, or work, and is means in, so something in acting or something as would be closer to modern English, actual. Obviously, in act or actuality itself is the most comprehensible because it is the ground from which every inquiry about movement must start, since various forms of movements are incomplete in themselves, i.e. they cannot provide as with the, all the qualifications intrinsic to movement as a form of act. As for what things in act are, or why are they such and such, this is a matter of further investigation that includes its discursive knowledge. Again, Aristotle puts it clearly, quote, Concerning non-complex asyntheta beings, what pertains to being and non-being, or to true and false, in regard to them? For it is not something conjoined, syntheton, that is synthetic, obviously, so that it would exist when it is conjoined, or would not exist when it is divided, as when the, for instance, quote, tree is white. The true and false there are like this. The true is to touch, he gain, and to say fanai, for saying is not the same as putting forward an affirmative premise, that is cataphasis, whereas the ignorance is in not to touch. Whatever then is being or act about those, there is no error, but only thinking or not thinking them. But there, what is, is todeti in Greek, their usia or substance or what we would now call the essence, Aristotle has a bit different understanding of essence. It, but there what is, is the subject of inquiry, namely are they really such or no, end quote. 
The question whether life is good in itself is therefore convertible with the question whether life is energia or no. The inference tree is white is what would we would now in the tradition of Kant call synthetic inference, where the mode and truth of the is is concomitant to some kind of synthetic act. Tree is white is true only far insofar as the tree actually is white, and this cannot be known by the simple act of thinking, but only by discursive act that works with affirmations and negations. However, if we take is in itself, it is a predication based on actuality, i.e. the intellectual mode in which actuality exists. And if we don't know this simple fact immediately, then our knowledge is quite analogous to mental blindness. We are trying to describe something before our eyes, while at the same time denying the existence of light in which we see it, something that is apparently easier to do than it seems at first sight. Whereas verb, as the semantic expression of action presupposes subject of action, the expression is presupposes only being itself, which is present both in subject and predicate, and this being, if taken by itself, can be understood only as energia. To clarify, in the commentary on Aristotle's Perihermeneas, or on interpretation, St. Thomas Aquinas has this to say about the nature of the expression is. Quote, Being is nothing other than that which is. And thus we see that it signifies both a thing, when I say that which, and existence, esse, where esse, I'm interpolating here, esse is energia, the, or the act of being. When I say is, or est. If the word being, that is ens in Latin, as signifying a thing having existence, were to signify existence or esse principally, without a doubt, it would signify that a thing exists. But the word being or ens does not principally signify the composition that is implied in saying is or est. Rather, it signifies with composition, this is very important, inasmuch as it signifies the thing having existence. Such signifying with composition is not sufficient for truth or falsity. For the composition in which truth and falsity consists cannot be understood unless it connects the extremes of a composition. Therefore he, that is Aristotle, says that the verb is signifies with composition, for it does not signify composition principally, but consequently. It primarily signifies that which is perceived in the mode of actuality absolutely, for is, said simply, signifies to be in act, and therefore signifies in the mode of verb. However, please pay attention, the actuality which the verb is principally signifies is the actuality of every form commonly, that is to say universal being, whether substantial or accidental. Hence, when we wish to signify that any form or act is actually in some subject, we signify it through the verb is, either absolutely or relatively, absolutely according to present time, relatively according to other times. And for this reason, the verb is signifies composition not principally, but only consequently, end quote. <clears throat> now this was a bit difficult, so we'll unpack it. Aquinas denies that being, that is ens, is said equally according to categorical predication, in the sense that quantity and quality, or substance and accidents, are equal explications of what beings are. On the contrary, being is said, quote, according to prior and posterior. As, for example, the substance has more being than accident, because accident is implicit in substance and is predicated according to substance. Therefore, universal being is not some kind of linguistic hypostasis, as it is mostly being understood in modernity, but act, that is to say, esse or energia, 
present in every mode of being in a different way, according to its original instance, which is its purest form and through which all others participate in the cause of why they are what they are. What we call reality, to an extent our intellect can grasp it, is not the pure act of being, but precisely the effect of participation of all other acts in it, primarily present to mind in its purest instance comprehensible, i.e. in the transcendental being, or esse energia present in all as a sort of light that quote-unquote opens the world to knowledge. Therefore, to get back to Aristotle's examples, life is purer than the mere movement, yet in all its forms known to intellect, it is not such that we can call it pure life, only that it is the purer form of energia than spatial movement, and we understand this because we are endowed with a priori understanding of energia. Introducing demonstrative knowledge in the realm of what we can intuit as higher than this, i.e. into the origin of ens universalis, of universal being, would mean introducing both human and humanly comprehensible natural necessity into origin of all necessity, which, as such, cannot be subjected to any form of necessity. Therefore, the word is signifies composition consequently, not principally. Because the origin of composition, i.e. the act of participation that provides being and unity, cannot be understood inside the discrepancy of subject and object at work in propositional language, but can rather be represented in symbols, of which we already have mentioned one, light. While contemplating these passages, one is forced to reconsider the tried and tested phrase about being touched with reality, as well as the nature of the simplicity of insight it entails. Could such reality and such simplicity provide the basis for the creation of the system? Well, let us explicate a resounding no. Aristotle's strangely ca casual remarks should certainly make one pause, uh, because with them he is describing the key issue. We cannot be fooled about reality in the sense that, once we are in touch with it, we can exchange it for something else without willful ignorance. So we cannot, for example, take the act of living as anything else but what it is, an act. We can deny this only if we haven't attempted to comprehend it at all. But once it is established what it is on the grounds of its act, we cannot be fooled into wrong understanding by further discursive re reasoning, save by willfully ignoring its ground. Once one takes life in consideration as a form of act, the inference resolves in insight that life is more fulfilled and hence comprehensive form more comprehensive form of act than the mechanical or biological movement. Also, this implies that hierarchy of actual forms is the participatory hierarchy, and the touch with reality is implicitly a touch, not with the origin, but precisely with the point where the presence, in Greek, parousia, of participation in origin is being transparent. This is indicated by the temporal vectors Aristotle points out in the first passage quoted. In living as living, there is no opposite to living, that is, there is no death. The purpose intrinsic to act is a part of its cause, or the intrinsic and comprehensive dimension of the presence of its ultimate cause, and as such has an ontological determinant of the past, as for every effect, the cause is always in the direction of the past. At every single moment of living, life already was present because it is continuous and non-complex. In the sense that nothing contrary to it can enter it or it would then cease to be life. 
The example is paradigmatic for understanding the traditional notion of simplicity, because we can clearly see that it is not referring to a product of logical and simultaneous materialist reduction, but quite the contrary. The simple act is the one that entails the abundance of qualities while lacking all those determinations that would reduce this abundance because it suffers only determinations distinguished into one undivided being. Therefore, to say that life is self-sufficient would mean that it cannot be reduced to a single one quality, as for example movement of the parts of organism. But all the qualities indivisible from it are necessarily present when it is present, or they all have to participate in the higher form where it is present. For example, this entails that biological movement is called life only insofar as it participates in the act of living, which is in itself simpler and at the same time more encompassing than the movement of organisms. Animal life therefore cannot be a basis for understanding the life itself. But only the simple act of life as such can serve such function. And this is what touch of the mind and reality discloses. No matter is it being explicit or implicit. The knowledge of the child nourishing his elderly parent is not less real than the same knowledge held by philosopher doing the same thing for his parent. Figain is pre-reflexive, yet wholesome and sufficient to serve as an underlying purpose of moral act, nevertheless. In the contrary example of movement, which is a form of act only so far it is like pure form of act, The end, and likewise the vector of the past, or origin, is extrinsic. I am not healed while I am being healed, and an act of healing cannot be understood from itself, but only from its subsequent purpose, the health. This means that act of healing can produce non-simple result. It can produce a contrary to health. So movement is the ground for technical operation because it acts upon other or the same as other. When physician heals himself, he is also a patient to himself. In this sense, every form of technical knowledge is prone to fundamental mistakes and can indeed run contrary to its purpose, whereas the act, such as the act of life, can never do that because at every given moment its purpose is intrinsically present. One quite interesting consequence is just how obvious this is. It is no accident that Aristotle is not much troubled about providing the basis of the act of understanding it in just a few words. Words, we might add, used even today in a phrase of, quote, having or not having the touch of with reality. Surprisingly, often, the more or less the same meaning, albeit without consciousness of it. The degree to which a particular energeia is comprehensible is the degree to which it is pure. Yet this doesn't mean that such a thing is readily obvious to human understanding. The example of life and even more of the act of thought are paradigms upon which man can conjecture about the higher forms of energeia, precisely because we cannot experience them of ourselves in their pure state. Whereas every act of life is pure to an extent it is in act. No act of life is infinite. The finitude doesn't come from some discernible biological necessity which one might find in the matter out of which the living body is being formed, but in the outside limit that is somehow imposed upon it, as if it were intrinsic. Certainly, as much as we are aware that our life has no inherent limit while it lasts, We are as much aware that it has a limit, the limit that is a clear contrary to its purpose, that makes it one and indivisible energeia. The most important thing here is that this truth is not apparent from the life itself, i.e. it is not grasped by the touch with its reality. Matter itself, as a basis of all somatic life, 
is an obvious impediment to its infinity, but our original intuition of life is not its finitude, or its material or potential being, but precisely its infinity. Because the natural understanding of life is the understanding of the form of energia. Finitude is the fact that is strangely incomprehensible on this primordial level of knowledge, and no amount of reasoning can make it impact the mind with the same strength as its opposite. We preserve human life without second thought, whereas we need a quite elaborate argument to justify its termination. This elaborate argument can be brought to inner consistency only by the creation of the system that is completely unconditioned by the inner touch of thought and energy of living. One of the reasons why it is so difficult to demonstrate the most simple and the most obvious could very well be because it is so simple and it is so obvious that it is indemonstrable. Demonstration is an intellectual act which resolves particular being into at least its proximate cause. We say that we demonstrated what something is when we can categorically infer why it is so and so. However, in order to at least be able to attempt it, we already have to know what is and what is not in the universal sense. If we don't know that life is a form of energia, about whose universal nature the knowledge already exists, then our inference will be erroneous in the sense that it can satisfy the logical structure of correct judgment, but its ground will not be energia of life, but a reflexive concept derived from some form of conscious interpretation of being. Even non-being. One of the most stubborn obstacles to understanding the fine line dividing modern and traditional understanding of reality is the conflation of insight with consciousness. Aristotle has shown us that insight does not have to be conscious, i.e. it doesn't have to be externalized into body of correct inferences, but can, and to some extent must, be intrinsically grasped in order to serve as a basis for discursive thinking. This, however, doesn't mean that it is intuitive in the psychological sense, or at least that it can be isolated as such. Between mind and reality as such, there is no principle, but only consequent opposition. The point at which they converge is the reality in which they both exist, and difference emerges in the act of probing this reality further by inquiring why it is precisely such as it is. The question why reality is at all, and not rather nothing, a supposedly universal, but in reality quite modern utterance, simply doesn't apply here, because every thought is a thought of being, not nothing. Consciousness, on the other hand, presupposes that in every true act of knowledge, I have to be taken into account. Knowledge is in the sense that it is a product of the intelligent subject, grasping its object. As such, the idea of knowledge that does not know that it knows is absurd in this context. But only because of the subtle shift in the expression. I know if I know that I know now means I know if and only if I can externalize and this means objectify what is known. Because the reality's principle is something other than I am. This act is the basis of system thinking. In the following, we'll attempt to explicate its nature and reasons why it is quite unnatural for human beings, as well as the concomitant notion of consciousness, which is conflated with reflective insight, whereas in reality it is its exact opposite. An act we might add in advance, far more appropriate to self-referential machine than the living organism, let alone human being. Thank you.